Hello, I'm Lucy. And I'm Michelle. Welcome to another episode of Tudor Referis, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, Reginald Bray. Reginald just doesn't, it doesn't ring Tudor to me. No. <laughs> it's also called Reynold, which sounds a bit, that sounds too early. It sounds too Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. So anyway, it's Reginald Bray. Yeah. Well, first of all, we've got some more patrons to thank. Yay, thank you. Kim Whittaker, Maggie, Designer Ruse, Anne Maxwell and Emily Charlton. Oh, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Right, Reginald Bray. If you look up Reginald Bray on Wikipedia, under personal, you get marriage and death. Oh, mm. that's not a lot. No. So this episode is going to be more of a study of politics under Henry the Seventh, <laughs> rather than a <laughs> seriously psychological I we were end up with of, of Bray. Tons on Reginald Bray. There's a lot on Reginald Bray, but there's not much on him, him as a person. Personally. Yeah, right. You know what positions he held when, but I don't. We don't know. About, we don't know anything about his personal life really. So no. it's going to be all about his work. Yeah, come to think of it, researching Margaret, because Reginald's all the way through her. Mm. And yeah, it's entirely his actions, not really anything about his personality at all, or his family or anything. Mm. It's just what he did for her. Yeah. Huh. Was Bray really a little woolly lambkin compared to Dudley and Empson? Who was pulling the strings? Henry or Bray's counsel? If Bray hadn't died when he did, and Dudley and Empson hadn't risen up to take his place... Would we now look up, look back on Henry's reign as being one of the greatest governments? Oh, good question. Good question. We might necessarily answer these questions, but we will ask them. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, the problem I found with researching Bray is that there was a lot was done. And Bray did a lot. But the difficulty right. was working out exactly what Bray was responsible for. Because was it Bray? Was it Morton? Fox? Thomas Lovell? Hussey? Or one of the myriad other new men. Or, right. or was it Henry? It's hard to pinpoint exactly what could be attributed to Bray. But that's the nature of councils, really, isn't it? Just collective decisions. Yes. Did he not... Well, Fox ended up doing a bunch of stuff that was just Fox, or Fox was head of the delegation that was supposed to do it. Yeah, there's a, there is that. Okay. But there's an awful lot that is the group of them. Right. That uh, you can't work out. I mean, it's meant to be a, a, a episode on Bray, but it's you know it's an episode on a group of people working together. It feels kind of like that would give you some safety, though, because if anything went wrong, you could disperse the blame. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure I'm sure they did. <laughs> <laughs> you can't behead all of us. There were ten of us involved. Yes. <laughs> One of them must have had a blank gun and could say no. Nope, wasn't it? <laughs> Anyway, come with me, if you will. Quote, I will go no further, said Kay, as if to see what would happen. The gentlemen did not need to make any answer. It was enough that they did not loosen their grip on Kay and tried to move him on. But Kay resisted them. I'll soon have no need of much strength. I'll use all of it now, he thought. He thought of the flies that tear their legs off, struggling to get free of the fly paper. But he became suddenly aware that there was no point in his resistance. There would be nothing heroic about it if he resisted. If he now caused trouble for these gentlemen, if in defending himself he sought to enjoy the last glimmer of life, he started walking, unquote. So that's Kay in Franz Kafka's The Trial, caught on the flypaper, as many were caught in the machinations of the Council Learned in Law, the brainchild of Ooh. Reginald Bray. Oh, that's uncomfortable. Mm. Oh, that's so... Hmm. Despairing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, actually, I haven't read the trial for ages, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go back to it and see if it is relevant to, <laughs> to what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. John Guy, the historian who wrote Tudor England, wrote that Henry's reign was in three parts. And part one was 1485 to 92, and that's when your Bishop Fox was in charge. Yeah. Part two, 1492 to 1503, was Reginald Bray's time. Okay. And then according to John Guy, part three, 1503 to 09, Henry was in charge with Dudley and Empson doing his bidding. 
Hmm. Because we aren't sure which way around it is, but that's what he seemed to think. It's interesting how it's just sort of slot into three sections. Yes. And the last one is definitely the worst. <laughs> yes. Bray's life. He was born in 1440 in Worcestershire. His father was a surgeon and a bit of a mystery, since in some sources I read, it said that he was a lowly bone setter and bloodletter. But other sources said that it was thought that he was King Henry VI's own, own physician. Oh, that's quite a difference. Well, they're not mutually exclusive, I suppose, because even kings need their bone setting. But yes. it does make it difficult to place Bray socially. Yes, but that's different. A physician does one thing. Surgeons, barber surgeons, were something completely different mm. at the time. Yeah. So those are two very different skill sets and training. Yes, which is why it was difficult to work out how how much Bray had raised himself from his family situation. Because if if his dad was the king's physician, then you know he's already part of the court. But if he's just bog standard barber surgeon, then he's yeah. done very well for himself. And also a bone setter is a third, because that's usually the blacksmith. Yeah. He was educated at the Royal Grammar School in Worcester. And that's that for his childhood. I oh. <laughs> hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I get the feeling that nobody... I've been listening over and over and over again to the great courses mm. From Tudors to Stuarts. Which one is it here? Let me pull it Something up. Something like that, yeah. I'm listening to that one. Audible. It was good. It is mm. good. Yeah, History of England from the Tudors to the Stuarts. It's something I can listen to in bed. Um, there is almost an entire section about discussing whether or not parents recorded their children's childhood or if they stayed separate from them because they didn't know if they were going to live. And in the more prominent families, because they were being cared for quite often in another place, a house, another person's house, or in a nursery home, mm -hmm. like the royals did, there was nobody there to write down their childhood. So unless they remembered stuff and wrote it down, mm -hmm. that's why we don't have that information. I think how different it is now with kids being constantly filmed, everything they do. Oh, geez, yes. And being put on the internet where it never comes back down. You could never get away from your previous yeah. mistakes. <laughs> or how you looked when you were a teenager. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take pictures when you're at your worst. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the next thing we hear about Bray, he's the Receiver General and Steward of the household of Sir Henry Stafford and Margaret Beaufort. <laughs> I looked up Receiver General. It seems to be a general administrator who's responsible for accepting payments for the estate. So he's already... That makes sense, Receiver. Yep, he's already holding a financial position. In the 1460s, Bray's private account book shows him travelling all over the place on their estates and doing their legal affairs, which seems odd because he wasn't actually trained as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was accompanied by a lawyer, I don't know. But <laughs> it seems very <laughs> ill-advised. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit sort of a, yeah, it's like a days of court, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know anything about the law? I don't know. I, I could give it a go. <laughs> if you're pushed, I could give it a try. <laughs> he continued in Margaret's service when she married Thomas Stanley in 1472. He was then appointed trustee of Hadawa for 600 marks a year. And that's somebody who cares for the dower land to make sure that it continues to be prosperous, correct? Yes, Okay. And he, yes, I mean, they obviously trusted him to do it. Yes. Yeah. Well, he's going to give that a shot, just like he did the lawyer yes. stuff. <laughs> I suppose it's a bit different than being a warder to a child because the woman is there to, to overlook what yes. you're up to. With a husband who can defend her. So you're not stealing from her. You have to be accountable. You to be you're good. also getting a wage. Yeah. You. Rather than the money out of the dower lands like you do for children. Mm. Hmm. These guys make me start remembering the term renaissance man. Somebody who's good at everything. Mm. It sounds like you had to be. I mean, a bit later on, we've got his, one of his to-do lists. And he's yeah, everywhere, all over the place. Okay. With, with <laughs> Exhausting. Ex expertise in all, uh, a huge range of things. You just wouldn't do that wow. now, I don't think. Everyone is so specialised. Yes. 
Bray is known to have encountered the young Henry Tudor on at least two occasions. Once, in 1469, he was sent to Henry with money to buy him a bow and arrow. And Henry would be told... Oh, I remember that mm. in Margaret's thing. Actually, it's probably more than one arrow. <laughs> that would be a bit stingy, yes. isn't it? And she bought him a horse for... Um, she sent Bray to get him a horse later when he wanted to joust, even though his father said he couldn't. I didn't come across that. Oh, well, on, that, on this particular occasion, Thomas Penn in the, the Winter King described Bray as thick-set and shaggy-haired, which is not how I visualise him. <laughs> He's an ape! I think it's the name <laughs> Reginald. I see him as a rather dapper gent with a little little tash and a pin, yes. pinstripe suit and a polar hat. Yes, <laughs> yes, very much so. Mm. I don't see him as shaggy-haired. No, especially if he's doing the lawyer stuff. Mm. I was about to offend everybody who has a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> He comes across as those dogs. You see them on TV when they're ever, they're talking about experts and their hair is like mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm. The uh, Einstein look. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Einstein. Mm. <laughs> well, a year later, Bray accompanied Henry to visit King Henry VI. And that was the time when Henry VI said something like, you know, this, this lad is king material. He's definitely going to become king. And we thought, oh, yeah. Well, uh... I I disagree. Well, some historians dispute that this encounter ever took place and say that Henry Tudor never entered England before he was made king. But how many other people could Henry have known since he was a boy? I mean, not even his mum. Only Uncle Jasper. Yes. Well, he's, he did know his mum through the constant letters going back yeah. and forth. And she did visit him whenever she could, which admittedly wasn't often. Mm. But it sounds, when I was researching her, it sounded more like she was visiting him more than other aristocratic parents visited their children in other people's houses. But then once he was 14... It just wasn't the done thing. He was away. He, yes. Yeah. yeah. But, so, it's, hmm. yeah, it's not surprising that he trusted Bray because yes. not many other people, he wouldn't have known many other people from his childhood. Very true. Which is quite sad. Yeah. 1475, Bray seems to have accompanied Thomas Stanley on Edward IV's invasion of France. And in this year, he got married to Catherine Hussey. Oh, he got married? Hmm. For some reason, I always pictured him as single. Nope. Nope. He was married. He was in his 30s. She was quite a bit younger. She was 13. Oh, Mm. what? But she may have been a little chit of a thing, but she did bring lands in Berkshire, Sussex and Hampshire, which would have pleased oh, Bray geez. because he was later to be on a mission to buy up as much land as possible. I think we have fully proven one thing wrong from that great course's audiobook. He said that child marriages very rarely happened, and if they did, they only happened in royal families. Well, we've kind of proven that's not the case. We come across it all the time. All the time, yeah. and it's disturbing every single time. Yes, every 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 time we come across it, a little thirteen-year-old girl sort of flashes into my <laughs> mind. Like, oh, no. oh, mine too. Catherine advanced first in the household of Margaret Beaufort, and later with Elizabeth of York. So she'd have been in the court with Catherine Gordon, Mrs. Perkin Warbeck, amongst amongst oh. others. <laughs> 1478, Bray became MP for Newcastle under Lyme, and he did this either through Thomas Stanley's patronage or possibly the patronage of William Lord Hastings, who was to meet that abrupt end at the hands of Richard III. Right. And talking of Richard, Bray was in Margaret's service when she was party to the uprising against Richard by the Duke of Buckingham. (gasps) Uh Uh-oh. If you remember, John Morton was a prisoner of the Duke of Buckingham. Yes. But he must have had the gift of the gab since he convinced the Duke to rise against Richard. And Morton arranged for Bray to be the link between Buckingham and Margaret Beaufort. Oh, dear. Telling Buckingham that he knew of a man, quote, sober, secret and well-witted, unquote. And Bray was told to come to Brecknock, where Buckingham was, immediately, which he did. And he'd been told by Margaret, quote, as secretly as he could to draw others of the nobility to their side who would be able to help, unquote. And he engaged several other men to carry the plan into effect, including the ubiquitous Charles Dobney. <laughs> We've got to do an episode on him. Dabney! <laughs> <laughs> 
Unfortunately, as we know, the uprising was a disaster, largely due to the personality of the Duke of Buckingham himself. Yes. But Richard III did pardon Reginald Braith for all offences, including treason. Why? Well, precisely. It was a big mistake. Bray then went on to act as conspirator and fundraiser for Henry's invasion. Of course he did. And why did Richard pardon him? Do we have anything on that? I don't know. It, I mean, they, they just did, didn't they? Yeah, but still, I know he couldn't afford to lose so mm. many people, but he was the orchestrator of this, really. He he took two people and then expended it. I, he may have been able to play down what he did. Oh, I was just the messenger. I mean, I didn't really know what was going on. I, he, oh, I don't know. Could have done. I'm just the servant. Mm, just right. A, I was only doing my job. I don't know, but they do, they do seem to pardon people and invariably <laughs> it turned around and bite them. Yes. He sent Henry £336, 18 shillings and fourpence. For clo- I love the fourpence, for clothing materials for Henry and his servants. And we learn this from Polydor Virgil's Anglia Historia, but it's also backed up by documentation showing that Henry reimbursed Bray the money when he got to the throne. Yes, that was one thing he did, was reimburse mm. everybody who helped him. Yes. Which really was surprising. Yeah, I don't know where the money came from because he didn't have any at this time, did he? No. And also by the speed with which Bray had preferments heaped on him, including being knighted at the coronation. So, yeah, Henry obviously had reason to be pleased with him. Yes. And at the Battle of Bosworth, it's said that it was Reginald Bray who found the crown under the thorn bush. Oh, is this yet another? Everybody finds the crown and crowns Henry. Well, no, he gave, he gave it probably to Thomas Stanley, possibly to William to put on Henry's head so he was just the one scrabbling <laughs> under probably um Thomas and William thought oh, it's a thorn bush I'm not getting under there go on Reg <laughs> yes <laughs> so, oh, all right <laughs> he'll do it Bray even stayed in Margaret Beaufort's service after 1485 but then it was largely by proxy since much of his time was spent working for Henry and several members of Margaret's household were retained by Henry and I suppose that makes perfect sense because Henry had been abroad. He'd barely set foot in yes. England before becoming king, if at all. Yes, and her servants were loyal to her through all of the scheming. Mm. He wouldn't have known who, whom to employ or whom to trust. But if these people exactly. had, if she trusted them, then that was probably good enough for Henry. Yeah. And Bray was able to use the skills he'd learnt running Margaret's estates to running the country as a whole. I guess it would translate up, because you're just doing exactly the same thing, just on a larger scale. Mm. And the scale he was doing on was pretty big anyway. I mean, Margaret and Thomas had quite a lot of land. They owned a lot of land. <laughs> In September 1485, he became Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And a bit of background on the Duchy of Lancaster. This was the council running the king's own lands. So it was an estate manager, but on a huge scale. It's been said that Bray revamped the position, making it more efficient and maybe more ruthless, putting up rents, turfing people off when they couldn't pay and putting in other tenants who could. But in fact, such practices can be traced back as far as Henry IV and V. And this this is quite a running theme with Bray, because in the time when it was fashionable to say that the modern world started with Henry VII, a lot of what Bray did was said to be innovative. But these days, historians tend to believe that Bray and Henry and indeed Dudley and Empson, just did it all more. They didn't invent the stuff. They Right. It's like the new men. Mm. I'm currently researching Louis XI, the Universal Spider, for Patreon. Tudoriferous Patreon. Soft, shiny, and oh so manageable. And he also brought in new men. And this is before Henry or Isabella or any of them did it. It's a generation earlier. So it, they weren't unique in doing it. No. They were just unique in their countries doing it. Uh, well, not even that necessarily. Because yeah, much of the political, legal and financial stuff that was attributed to Henry VII's time had been there throughout the Middle Ages. Right. And Henry wasn't even the first to strengthen it. Edward IV had been doing much the same as he tried to drag the country out of the mess left by the Wars of the Roses. 
So where do we get this idea that this is new men? Well, I suppose they are new men because they... Com- they start as commoners. Yes, they do. And that's, that, that feeds through all of the Tudors, doesn't it? Because then you get people like Cromwell, w- uh, Woolsey, yes. Woolsey. Cecils. All of that. Were the Cecils commoners? Well, they weren't hugely noble. They weren't high up. Whereas before, but... it was con- the, the, the nobility were considered the natural advisors to the king, weren't they? Yes. Whereas... Yes, there was even protests in one reign. I can't remember which one. Where the nobles almost stood up and said, no, we are the ones you should be listening to. Mm. Which reign was that? <laughs> Actually, I think it's Louis XI. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> Whereas I suppose it's more fun to say that it's all new and shiny and it's entering on a completely different world with the Tudors, but no. But it's not true. It's not true. The, the facts don't back it up. Oh, gosh, we're such revisionists. <laughs> <laughs> but the council became the central institution of government in Henry VII's reign in a way that it hadn't for the previous kings of England. Yeah, and as we were saying, another way in which it was different under Henry was that the council brought together peers, bishops and other clergy, knights, lawyers, officers of finance. He was getting a much wider perspective than in the, if he just relied on the nobility. The council started work soon after Henry's accession. This is the general great council. We're not onto the council learned in law yet. Okay. Uh, it met in the Star Chamber, so-called, because it had stars painted on it. Did it really? Yeah, it did. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Unfortunately, details of what they talked about are missing for the whole of Henry's reign. Oh, goodness. The only thing we have are some extracts copied in the 16th and 17th century. And I don't know why they were copied, but it's just as well they did, since that's all there is. Oh. So apart from royal finances, they discussed foreign policy and defence. In February 1486, Bray was made treasurer of England by word of mouth, not by contract, which is odd. And I'm not sure how we know about it since it was done by word of mouth, except he presumably yeah. started doing the job. This post was normally filled by the nobility. In July of the same year, John Lord Dynam took over on a more official footing, you know, with the proper letters patent and everything. <laughs> And his name, name written down. <laughs> but he still did it jointly with Bray. And I was wondering, did Bray just refuse to leave? Did he just keep turning up at the meetings? <laughs> <laughs> he was continuing to negotiate loans for the Crown and to provide loans to the Crown in his own name, which shows that he must have been pretty wealthy, pretty much from the get-go. Yes. No kidding. And we know that he certainly was wealthy later on. He, along with several others in Henry's court, received that nice little pension from the Treaty of Etaples. Oh, mm. yes. He was the richest of Henry's new men. Bray's contribution to the benevolences, this is a, a, a loan stroke tax that we'll come to in a bit, um, of 1451, was £500 and was exceeded wow. only by Margaret Beaufort. Oh. Mm. So either he was exceptionally wealthy or quite generous. <laughs> I still think it's ridiculous that you're taxing your own mother. Yes. <laughs> you would think she'd be exempt from that at least. It wouldn't, wouldn't look good, though, would it? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to take money from everybody in the world, I am not taking <laughs> money from my parents. My parents are exempt. <laughs> my brothers and sisters are exempt. <laughs> They're family, for goodness <laughs> sake. <laughs> well, she had an awful lot of land, didn't she? So... And he's between. What about Henry here, for goodness sake? <laughs> of course he's going to tax his mum. <laughs> I'm surprised he wasn't taxing his children. Yeah. You may be six months old, yes. but you owe yes. me money. <laughs> Hand over your pocket money. <laughs> <laughs> However, the amount these people, these new men, were getting was peanuts compared to the sort of wealth and nobility any of the bishops might have. And it was nowhere near the sort of wealth Thomas Woolsey was later to amass. Oh, geez, yes. It's not the amount of money these people had which bowled people over. It was the speed with which they accumulated this money. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah. everybody else would have gotten it generationally yes. over the generations, whereas they're just developing it within a single lifetime. A very, within a couple of years in some time, cases. Yes. yes. They were lending money to the gentry. Thomas Lovell lent the Queen £500. So the nobility, the nobility may show contempt for these people, but like Maximilian and Jakob Fuger, they often needed them. Yes. 
especially if they were tainted or something like that. I mean, it's or later on, if they've come uh, to, into contact with the Council of Learned in Law, they might need a, a loan or two. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That would be terrifying. Yep. Bray was made Chief Justice for the Forest South of Trent, jointly with Lord Fitzwalter. In 1486, Fitzwalter was replaced by... Can you guess? Fox? Dobney. <laughs> Dobney. Are we going to continue with Dobney or are we going to go with what his his area, whatever are they called, the caretakers or something? Yeah, if it's a place at uh, Barrington Court. They they called him Dabney. Dabney. But we've said Dobney all the way it through. It looks like Dobney. It does. Yeah. Or Dobney, really, I suppose. Mm. Anyway, mm-hmm. I checked the dates here and why Fitz, Fitzwalter disappeared. And that was when he was executed alongside William Stanley, when they were found guilty of treason for siding with Perkins. Ah. So, yeah, I mean, he could hardly be expected to continue his job in those circumstances. <laughs> We're already there. <laughs> wow. And also linked to this was Bray's appointment to officers in the Welsh marches and the Duchy of Chester, which I'm sure you will remember was William Stanley territory. Yes. 1487, Bray was at the Battle of Stoke, as were several of the new men. And you think, well, why would lawyers and financial experts turn out to fight a battle? Did they, or were they there to watch, record it? Well, these new men must have realised their own personal danger should any of the rebellions against Henry be successful. Ah. So if you look at Richard III's sidekicks, Ratcliffe and Catesby, they they had suffered badly under yes. Henry's rebellion because Ratcliffe was killed on the battlefield and Catesby was executed soon after. And yes. Francis Lovell had to make a run for it. So what would have happened to the likes of Bray had if John the de la Pole had been successful. Yeah, you'd want to be there. So they, if they have land, they can supply troops. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, fodder. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> in 1488, he was given the commission, given a commission to raise a quota of archers for the relief of Anne of Brittany. And if you'd like to know more about the relief of Anne of Brittany, just like the people who became entangled with the council learned, you got to pay since her... <laughs> Her fascinating <laughs> life is on our Patreon feed. <laughs> That's horrible. Tudoriferous Patreon, as the actress said to the bishop. <laughs> you don't pay much. <laughs> In 1495, Bray was given custody of Carysbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight, which is not relevant to much, but anyone who's been on the Isle of Wight will know the Carysbrook Castle. This is Carysbrook Castle. I mean, this is... (laughs) Places I want to go. Well, I lived on the Isle of Wight, so I mean, Carysbrook Castle... Of course you did. (laughs) ...is just huge, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the Isle of Wight's got Carysbrook Castle and Osborne House for um, Victoria. Yes. In 1496, Henry demanded loans from his subjects in anticipation of the income from the taxation that Parliament had agreed to for the war against Scotland. And that, this was the tax that so enraged the Cornish. Yes. And it was Bray's job to try and extract this money from Londoners. I didn't quite get this. Ooh. We're going to ask you to lend us money until such time that you will owe us the money in taxes. So did they then repay oh. the loan and then take it straight back in the form of taxes? The idea was to get the money, they, they needed it now. If they wanted the war against Scotland, they didn't want to be faffing about trying to get, get taxes. So they, they go to people say, right, well, you've got to give us this money now. And then we will work well, out how much you owe in taxes. So The exchequer took a really long time. And mm-hmm. it is possible that they took a loan from the nobles or whoever had the land that would include the amount they would get from the lower orders. Mm-hmm. So they would pay back a portion of it, whatever was supposed to come from the commoners in London and everywhere else. Mm. So you're actually giving me more money than you owe. You will get some of this back. Maybe. Possibly. I mean, it was called benefices, which sounds all sort of very gentle and, and voluntary, yes. doesn't it? You're going to but... give it... It's a gift. Yes. It's a gift. Please, please. I don't I, have to pay this back. I don't need it. Just take it. Yeah. Yes. Bray didn't get everything he was, he was sent to get. Quote... The king sent my lord treasurer with Master Bray and other honourable personages unto the mayor, requiring him and his citizens of a loan of £4,000. 
Wherefore the mayor assembled his brethren and the common council upon the Tuesday following, by whose authority was then granted to the king a loan of £2,000, unquote. Ooh, that's half. <laughs> that's just half, yeah. A short history of tax up to, up to Henry VII. Don't switch off, you know. It is more interesting than it sounds. The type of tax we came across in the Cornish episode, the 15th and 10th, which was assessed on movable goods, came into being in 1334. And that was 10% of your goods if you lived in the country and 15% if you lived in town. But England had changed a lot since then. The Black Death, the increased wealth from the, from the cloth industry, enclosures, and the assessments made back then were no longer relevant. And since then, there have been attempts to change the form of tax, incomes from land or poll taxes. But these just led to protests, as poll taxes are wont to do. And I've, I've yes. been on a poll tax protest. <laughs> I mean, these things carry on. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's hilarious. And they didn't raise much more than the 15th and 10th. However, Henry VII decided he was going to give it another go. And again, it led to protests and non-payments. He had wanted to raise £75,000 for his war in Brittany. And even though he stressed that this was just a one-off, it wasn't a precedent for future demands. There would be future demands, but it wasn't a precedent. <laughs> of course there would be. It's like income tax. Income tax in Canada was supposed to be temporary during the war. <laughs> I'm still paying temp- yeah. income tax. <laughs> well, he only managed to raise 24000 But he was getting more in tax than his predecessors since he was taxing on both the 15th and 10th and on wages and land. And I, cu- oh. I couldn't find out how much of this was due to Bray, but he was his financial advisor, so you assume a lot. <laughs> so there was income tax, since you said wages. Wages, yeah. That's what it said. So, huh. hmm. And they said income tax was a new invention. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. I did, actually, when I've, when I've jotted that down... I only sort of thought about the land a bit and thinking, well, it's another poll tax. But yeah, and wages as well. Yeah. Bray coordinated much of the work on wardships. And he hunted out heirs that should, by rights, be the king's wards. And then sold them on, renting out the land to others. The idea was that the king, oh, would, be, <laughs> the king would be compensated for the loss of military service that the succession of a minor brought. That was the thinking behind okay. the wardships in the first place, which is not something I'd realise. Neither did I. Hmm. Why Why would it do that? If you're giving it to... Hmm. He can still presumably raise troops, or his, yes. his servants would. Because his father might have changed, but he, the land hasn't, hmm. who you... I was going to say own, but <laughs> yeah. who you control hasn't changed. You could still get military service out of them. Weird. I suppose it's specifically that one person. He's not going to go to war. And he's not going to lead his troops into war. Leadership, mm. maybe. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, we saw in Francis Lovell's episode that wardships could be split into their component parts, with the Earl of Warwick yes. getting the right to marry Francis off, while Edward IV keeping the rents from the land. But we also saw how difficult it was for Francis to chase up the Lovell land that had been sold on. I wondered if this was deliberate, because the more complicated you can make it, the less likely the ward was to get his land back. Oh, that's horrible. It is. The whole point of wardships was to protect the child from unscrupulous relatives who might swoop down on the orphan child and take their stuff. So now you're just giving it to unscrupulous strangers. Yes. (laughs) Now you can buy the right to swoop down on the orphan child and take their stuff. (laughs) That's much better. Oh, yes. Yes, Mm. much better. There were rules regulating what a warder could and couldn't do, but I don't know how much this was policed. I doubt it was at all for some of the stories we've read. Mm. Some wardships ended up with absolutely nothing at the end and had to go to court to try to get anything back. Yeah. And they were borrowing the money to take the, per- the person to court. Yeah. And by the time you finish, you might still not have, not have anything because you just spent it all on court cases. Yes. <sighs> Under pressure from Henry, revenues from wardships rose from just £300 in 1487 to 1,500 Oh, my goodness. To 6,000 in 1502. 6,000! That's a huge leap. And this was an example of how busy Bray was, because his responsibility for wardships was just part of his portfolio of many other responsibilities. But oh, on his God. death, the Office of Master of Wards was created to deal specifically with that one issue. 
And Henry also created the office of surveyor of the king's prerogative after Bray died, because that was another role that Bray was heavily associated with. That we thought that actually, actually we need we need a single person to do this. We haven't got a superman like Bray anymore. We, <laughs> we need separate people to do all these separate jobs. I wonder if Bray took satisfaction in that. Because I know when I was doing one particular job and when I left, they hired four people to take over for what I was doing by myself. I was like, ah, see, told you I was good. (laughs) I don't think Bray got a chance to see, unfortunately. (laughs) But we can see how busy Bray was because this is one of his to-do lists. The list is as follows. Find jailers for escaped prisoners. Process the sales of of royal wardships and marriages. Investigate customs offences, including a shipload of tin that had been impounded in Southampton. Check the details of the king's will. Conduct an audit into the household accounts and carry out an investigation into all revenues and receipts that had not been properly accounted of Henry's lands. I mean, I don't think that was one day. I mean, that was presumably something. Yeah, I hope so. But that's a lot. That's quite a lot of disparate, disparate stuff. Yes. To get his head round. And we get confused, well, not confused, but we we get this idea of how long things take, but we're always thinking of modern technology. Oh, well, Mm. if you had a spreadsheet, it would only take them like 45 minutes to get this all calculated out. No, they're doing it on parchment. (laughs) Yeah, and things have got to be sent, waited for. Yes. Reply comes back, you're saying, oh, no, hang on, change that. Yes. I don't think it (laughs) was. Yes, or no, you misunderstood me. (laughs) Let's Mm. try this again. It would take forever. Or you're deliberately misunderstanding me if it's Ferdinand and Henry. Yeah. June 1497, Bray was at the Battle of Blackheath, fighting against the Cornish protesters. He was made a knight banneret. And the lands in Surrey of Lord Audley, who was executed beside with the Cornish, wearing that torn paper armour that <laughs> so confused us at the time, <laughs> went to Bray. Bray. So there we go. Silver lining. Hmm. Hmm. We should. I'm going to need an episode of all of these different ranks. Yeah, because I'm not sure what a knight banneret is. I have it no idea. Less than, less than being knighted, but yeah, the more. et makes it sound like you're a little knight. Yes, yes, a tiny, <laughs> a tiny, tiny knight. <laughs> you don't get the whole costume. You get the boots. <laughs> <laughs> you get a little hat like Peter Pan. <laughs> In 1498, you're like this. Bray personally delivered the indictment for the murder of a mere commoner <laughs> oh, <laughs> to Edmund de la Pole. Edmund de la Pole. <laughs> and I bet he got a right earful for it as well. Oh my gosh, I could just see Edmund de la Pole going absolutely purple with rage. And how dare you, because yeah. you're a commoner. I don't care if you've been knight baroneted. <laughs> I think Bray could easily give as good as he could. I think so too. <laughs> that was probably why he was chosen. <laughs> And later, after Edmund had fled, there were rumours that he was about to invade and a a detachment of Bray's men were sent to Porchester Castle on the south coast, which had been taken over by de la Pole's sympathisers. So he's a man of action, not just (laughs) ledgers and accounts. He gets on his horse and leads the men down to (laughs) arrest these people. Okay, because his name is Bray, I might have been picturing a donkey this entire time. I still got him in a pinstripe suit and bowler hat on his, on his horse. I'm seeing a little donkey with a little knight's hat going around <laughs> doing all this. Oh, these poor people. I mean, they were all doing amazing things and we just belittle them the whole time. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 1501. Bray's role on the arrival of Catherine of Aragon was to negotiate with London about the cost of pageants and who was going to pay. In other words, explaining to them that Henry wasn't going to pay. And what, were, what were they going to do about it? So. Come on, Londoners. <laughs> yeah, not only that, but following the flight of Edmund de la Pole, Henry decided that the wedding celebrations needed ramping up a bit. Yes. Think, yeah. And the usual wine fountain that was to be outside St. Paul's was now to be replaced by another pageant, bigger and better than any of the others. Oh, dear. An artificial mountain covered in jewels and roses. Right. And, not in the least bit tacky. No, and they had to have guards all the way around it to make sure people didn't steal from it. Well, yes, precisely. What a <laughs> stupid thing to put in the middle of London. <laughs> <laughs> but this time the Londoners, Londoners pointed out that they'd paid for all the other pageants and had sent a present of gold plate to Catherine, so enough was enough. Yes. Henry had to foot the bill, but he wasn't happy. No. 
and a complete rabbit hole. <laughs> I was looking up the finances behind Catherine and Arthur's wedding, and I discovered that this was the sixth most expensive royal wedding of all time. <gasps> really? Number five was Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Did you know that the, um, the movie business that she was with, I can't remember if it was Universal Studios or not, they actually paid her dowry? Really? Yes, because Goodness. the Prince of Monaco wouldn't take her without a suitable dowry for a princess. So they foot the bill and they made it all back in the advertisement and the publishing of the wedding. Like they've, they sort of hello magazine type. Yeah. Okay. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> <laughs> Number four was Prince Pavlos of Greece and Mary Chantal Miller. Don't know those. No. Number three, Princess Victoria of Sweden and Daniel Westling. Number two was Al Mucht Muchtadi Bilar, the Sultan, the heir of the Sultan of Brunei, and Sarah Sally. That would make sense. Sa Sarah. That does not sound like an Eastern name, Sarah Sally. No, no these second names don't do sound as if they they're not quite of the same class. Maybe. I'm not no, sure. Daniel Westman. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he sounds like an actor to me. Yes, he does. And number one, do you know what number one was? The most expensive one. I would like to say Victoria and Albert, but I don't think so because they were pretty broke. Mm. Charles and Diana. Charles and Diana, that was my next yeah. guess. Yes. You think we were paying for that out of our taxes? And her famous wedding gown. Yes. But goodness. I preferred Kate's. So, uh, it's amazing to think that a, a, a wedding that took place 500 years ago is the, still that the sixth expensive. most expensive. Jeez. I mean, obviously, it's all been relativized if that's a word yes for today's money but yeah but still. And, and just the thing that Catherine's mum said no don't make a fuss <laughs> and <he> said, <laughs> i'm gonna make a fuss <laughs> no no gosh Catherine at the end was probably thinking if you had spent less money on the wedding i could use that money now <laughs> yeah yes i'm eating stale <laughs> fish <laughs> Bray's influence in a missive to Spain in 1498, de Puebla said, quote, The persons who have the greatest influence in England are the mother of the king, the chancellor, Master Bray, the bishop of Durham, will that be Fox, Master Ludell, who's the treasurer, not sure about that. I don't know that name at all. No, no, I'd never come across it. The bishop of London, that's Thomas Savage, and the Lord Chamberlain. And the Lord Chamberlain, incidentally, was... Lord Dobney. <laughs> Again! <laughs> I should just guess that every time. Yes. The historian Margaret Condon said that Bray's influence with Henry was universally recognised and sometimes feared. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure what she meant by that. Did people think that whatever they said to Bray would get back to the king? Oh, possibly. Mm. Or if you've ticked off Bray, you're in trouble. Yeah. Hmm. It was said that he was allowed to contradict the king and could, quote, do anything with him. Oh, dear. Unquote. Yeah. Or well, less generous people said it just gave him the right to flatter the king. Hmm. But it seems unlikely. In the Great Chronicle, it's, they described him as, quote, plain and rough in speech, unquote. Which is probably why he was sent to talk to Edmund de la Pole. <laughs> <laughs> there must be no confusion here. <laughs> yes. He was the most omnipresent of Henry's men. It's always said that he was the equivalent of a prime minister, but I don't see how, how that can be because the prime minister is a single post, whereas he's just everywhere. He's got so many disparate roles. Yes. And a lot of them were unofficial. It's his influence with the king that gives him the power, not the posts he's got necessarily. Yes, but he's always there, whereas Fox was constantly on the move. If, mm. if he wasn't with the king, he was on some sort of diplomatic mission. Whereas Bray, it doesn't sound like leaves his side ever. No. And the king trusted him. Yes. And as we know, trust didn't come naturally to Henry. No. And best of all, of course, for Henry, Bray was producing money where there hadn't been any, any before. So yes. that's, that went down well. Thomas Penn says, quote, Bray, in short, did what all Henry's counsellors and servants were doing, only he did it best, unquote. Right. As I said, Edward IV had already started putting England's finances on firmer footing, but it became clear to Bray that the royal estates were still not getting all the money that he and Henry felt was due to them. Okay. 
The system was too cumbersome. Some officials were not doing their jobs properly, and some were corrupt. But now we have a chicken and egg situation. Bray decided that the Exchequer was not suitable for the job. It was too slow and unwieldy. Yes. And so it made sense to sidestep the Exchequer. Yes. Having sidestepped the Exchequer, where should the money go? Under Henry's bed. And it made sense to put it straight into Henry's coffers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we had an off off camera discussion about this. We had mentioned it in Fox this time. We didn't understand why this was such a big deal. And further research said that the exchequer was designed for people who were illiterate. So you were literally moving money around on a checkerboard so that both people, regardless of whether or not you could read, could understand the accounting. But it took forever because you weren't just doing sums. So you could spend a couple of weeks doing a single account, apparently. So getting it out of the exchequer and actually doing math would Mm. reduce that time period enormously for absolutely everything. But because of that, they didn't know where to put it. (laughs) So it went straight to Henry. And for a while, it was in a big chest under his bed. (laughs) I think Henry knew where to put it. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Which came first? The desire to make a slicker, more efficient financial situation, which purely coincidentally meant the money went to Henry, (laughs) or Henry's desire to keep the money for himself, which was facilitated by Bray arranging for the exchequer to be circumvented. Ooh, good question. Well, I know Henry was actually embarrassed a couple of times because he didn't have the money to pay for something immediately. Mm. Like, he couldn't say, go do this, I want to purchase this and hand over the money for it. Like, you go into a store. He'd have to wait a couple of weeks for the exchequer to give him the money, which is why he started keeping originally a chest of money under his bed, was so he could Mm. handle that for stuff like sending somebody immediately to go find Edmund de la Bull, who had just wandered (laughs) off. (laughs) Well, yeah, it's impossible to know which way around it was, but either way, it was quite nice for Henry. Yes. Also nice for Henry was that Bray and Morton were blamed for the taxes which provoked the Cornish uprising. Right. Mm. Edward Hall, the historian writing some 20 years later, said that kings take credit from whatever their subjects approve of, but, quote, if anything be done that soundeth not well in their ears, or is contrary to their opinion or fantasy, they will lay it straight to the council, unquote. Right. But I suppose they were very well paid, and that's what you paid for, isn't it? Yes. Take, Take the rap. Bray made money as well. How did he make his money? Well, he got a cut, or to put it more charitably, a commission on everything (laughs) he did for Henry. (laughs) He got retainers from nobles who wanted access to the king, including the king of France, who'd think that'd be a bit of a conflict of interest. He was getting that pension from the Treaty of Etarp. And he bought land, lots and lots of it. Because the problem with being a new man was that you had to rely entirely on Henry. You could marry an heiress, you could exploit the ward system, right? and Bray Bray did all of that, but the safest way to provide for your future and the future of your family was land. Yes. Bray bought up so much so quickly that he had a portfolio of properties that was such a jumble that it took ages for his heirs to sort it out after his death. Oh. We seem to be trying to create a belt of land from the Midlands through Bedfordshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire down to Surrey and Sussex. He spent £10,000 on land between 1485 and his death in 1503. That's a ton of money. Mm. And this was bringing in £1,000 a year. And that was was how much Francis Lovell was getting. And we said that he was a multimillionaire. Yes. Some of the land he bought as a straight transaction, but with some he used his political influence. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Bray brought out Lord Zucci's title to manors in Bedfordshire because Bray was able to have a word with the king on Zucci's behalf about a different matter. So bribes or extortion? Well, both parties seem to think they'd done okay by the arrangement, oh. so probably probably not extortion. Okay. Probably nearer bribes. Nearer bribes. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't so much of a bribe that I'm upset about. <laughs> yes. Uh, they both gained, we'll say. Oh, dear. <laughs> Henry did give his new men land, but as we know, he was quite sparing with his gifts of property, preferring to keep them as part of the royal estate. And Bray's trajectory was the opposite of someone like Dobney. Dobney had local power from the lands he owned, in this case Somerset, 
but Bray became powerful in the local areas due to the rise of the council system, and then he became rich and bought land. So they did it in the opposite way. And the manners the king did give him, Bray sometimes then bought the titles from the previous owner just to make doubly sure that no one could claim the land away again. You know, if he fell out with the king or something, it couldn't be yes. couldn't then be redistributed. Yeah. So it's quite an expensive gift. I think it's like it's like telling someone, I've bought you a holiday in the Bahamas, only you have to pay for your flights and your insurance and your luggage surcharge and your holiday. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so, yeah. So basically I've just given you permission to go on holiday. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, it's safety. Yes, I suppose so. Which I'm back to extortion then. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro de Ayala, who's usually got some pithy comment to make. Of course. <laughs> said that both the king and his ministers had, quote, a wonderful dexterity in getting other people's money, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> the council learned in law. I should put a sort of... Ooh. Yeah, we really do <laughs> yes. need some sort of foreboding music sound bite. <laughs> yeah, a gong, yeah. The original thinking behind the council courts was that they sped things up. They weren't as rigid as the common law courts, and they had the jurisdiction to ensure that even the highest in the land should pay up like the rest. And this is very laudable, you know, quicker, fairer justice. Yes, sounds like it so far. Yeah, Henry's Henry's councillors concentrated on abuses of power, corrupt juries, illegal retaining, perversions of justice. So, I mean, can't argue with that. Until they become the perversion of justice. (laughs) And one reason why Bray must have felt that his council was needed was that the main council was swamped with cases. We know of 300 cases brought to the council. Many of them were a bit sneaky. Yes, the Tudors were extremely litigious. They really liked taking each other to court. They did. And the majority of these were concerning outbreaks of rioting. Oh. Because Edward III had decreed that the council was forbidden to cover matters of, matters of freehold. So people would come to the council claiming that riots had broken out as a result of their complaint. Ah. Henry wanted to put a special emphasis on quelling rioting because he wanted to bring peace back to the country. So even if the council didn't investigate the case themselves, they would then pass it on to the common court for consideration, and this fast-tracked the case. Right. And lots of people must have been aware of this as a way of getting through the system relatively quickly because the council was absolutely deluged by people saying, oh, no, there's been rioting. There's been rioting. It needs to be stopped. <laughs> and then when they get to the common court, they can say, well, I wouldn't say it was actually rioting. <laughs> the Parliament of 1495 created a permanent final court of appeal. And anyone who believed himself injured in his rights by the packing of a jury or by their verdicts could get justice. And of the new jury found in the complainant's favour, each member of the original jury was fined £20 and could never sit on a jury again. Which I imagine the latter part was quite a relief for yes, everybody. Thank no one you. wants to sit on thank a jury. Thank you very much. <laughs> but £20 is a lot of money. I don't know. I want to sit on a jury at least once because I've never mm. been involved. It would be interesting to see. And in that way, I'm not in any trouble no matter what happens. <laughs> yeah. And my neighbour has been done it twice, but... No, never. I don't. I don't even know anyone apart from him who's done it at all. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I can't think of a single person that I know of that's done jury duty. Mm. Hmm. I don't know. I, quite a responsibility. True. Mm. In cases affecting the crown, appeal was made to a court entirely dependent on the crown. That is effectively to the crown itself, which doesn't seem very fair. No. And that also increased the prerogative of the crown. Right. And this seems like the sort of thing that Bray would have had a major part in, but we just don't know for certain, which is quite frustrating when you're doing an episode specifically on Bray. (laughs) (laughs) Some legislation may have stemmed from Bray or one of the new men, and yet seems to have come from Henry and his observations on how things were done in France. For instance, the Parliament of 1495 passed a law empowering judges of assize and... JPs, I don't think what JPs called, uh, Justice, Justice of, of the Peace, Peace. Yeah. on the information of a private individual to decide upon the initiation of judicial proceedings. The judge 
who authorised these, then referred the matter to his own court and awarded punishment according to the measure of the violation of the law. And that's just him. So, But treason, murder and more serious crimes in general were excluded from the Act. But it was a revolutionary law and not a little shocking since it's directly in opposition to the fundamental principles of English jurisprudence. Really? The legal officer, who would have been dependent on the king, took the place of a jury. Wow. He was public prosecutor and judge all in one person. Oh. And that was not how things were done in England. We don't know how much Bray actually had to do with this, but the date for it is 1495, so it's definitely before the Dudley and Empson excesses. Yes. And I include it to show that there was a totalitarian tinge to Henry's reign, which predated the, the Chuckle... I was always thinking of them as the Chuckle Brothers. And, <laughs> <laughs> and could be placed firmly in Bray's era. Oh. So, um, yes, it is not on to get rid of a jury and no. have someone answerable to, to the king. Yeah, not a good idea. No. And it seems that the legislation was so very French that it almost certainly it seems that Henry must have initiated it because it's what he would have seen when he was in France. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense now. Like, where did this come from? Well, if he had seen it, and yeah. seen it working. Yeah, and so, seen how useful it is for the king. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's great for the country, though. No. Nope. Or the people who get caught up in it. We learnt about the Council Learned in Law in Dudley and Empson's episode, and we decided that, on the whole, we didn't much like it. No, <laughs> not at all. But was it always the exploitative force that it became under Dudley and Empson, or was Bray's tenure a bit more benign? I don't... I can't see <laughs> any of this being benign. Well, it was introduced by Bray in 1495 to deal with the king's legal, financial and feudal matters. He was the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, as I said, and he was President of the Council Learned in Law. And that set a precedent for later presidencies because the President of the law of the Council was always the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. Why? Because, I presume, because Bray had been... Oh, OK. So yeah, it just You know a... how these things become a ritual almost, yeah. don't they? And also... One of the purposes of the Council Learned was to get as much as they could from Henry's land to give right. to Henry. Right. So I suppose it makes sense. Similar sort of job. This must have seemed great from the King's point of view. This was all stuff he was entitled to. So it couldn't be termed exploitative because he had a right to claim these funds. <laughs> <laughs> of course. The fact they hadn't been claimed before was down to incompetence or corruption amongst his officials. And surely it must be a good thing to root out the bad apples. Surely. Surely. Mm. <laughs> its main targets were Ashitas. Ashitas? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. That's people who assessed the value of properties of people who died in testate. Clerks of the peace and of assizes, stewards of the crown lands, sheriffs and under sheriffs. And it's hard to tell how much the council was resented at this time, since much of what we know about it was written after the fall of Dudley and Empson, when it was obviously extremely unpopular. Mm-hmm. Wilhelm Busch, writing at the end of the 19th century, very good book, by the way, said, quote, In Henry's administration of justice, there may be traced an irreconcilable contradiction, for ideas which were good and sound in their conception degenerate in his latter years into mere caricature, unquote. So that implies that in Bray's time, it was good. Yeah. The extraordinary thing is that the council learned was never officially constituted and very little is known about it before 1499. John Heron, who was Henry's first treasurer of the chamber, always got the king's signature on any transaction to serve as his indemnity against later prosecution. Oh! Mm, the council was so nebulous that Heron needed that tangible thing to act as a get-out-of-jail card. Oh. Should he ever literally need to get out of jail? Well, yes! <laughs> Because the account books of the tellers, this was quite recent uh, finding, apparently. The account, book, the account books of the tellers, who would be the first port of call for the money coming in as revenue, don't always tally with the accounts of John Heron. Really? Which definitely implies subterfuge rather than incompetence. Yes. Some of the money, much of the money, was going directly into Henry's coffers in the Tower of London and not being recorded in Heron's accounts, which were signed off by Henry. 
So Henry must have known about the money because he was getting the money. And he was probably dictating how much of that money he was getting. Mm. And how much should be written down and how much should just sort of gently... Yes. ...resting in his account. Yes. Some of this unrecorded money, or at least unrecorded by Heron, was paid directly to creditors and represents payments from the privy purse. So it was pretty much being treated like petty cash. How much Bray would have known about this, we just don't know. But he was everywhere. You know, if there was a pie in Henry's court, he had a, he had his fingers in it. He had to have known. He must have done. And I guess that's what he's that's what he's so well paid for, just to keep quiet about it, or to initiate it in the first place. Yes. Which seems more likely. Francis Bracon reckoned that Henry Bracon? was worth two. <laughs> Fran- Francis. <laughs> I thought I'd get away with that. Francis Bacon reckoned that Henry was worth two million pounds on his death, which has been dismissed as excessive. But the accounts that have been discovered, which represent further up the line from Heron, yeah. the money actually coming in rather than the money recorded as coming in, show that Bacon wasn't that far off. Really? Mm. However, despite his reputation for avarice and miserliness, Henry splashed the cash like any other king. I mean, we've just seen that it's the sixth most expensive wedding. Yes. And he liked to maintain a magnificent court since it gave him more credibility. Although the sixth most expensive wedding sounds like London spent most of it. (laughs) Yes, that's true. He recognised that in political life, both nationally and internationally, money was all powerful. Effectively, that was all he had, wasn't it? Yes. The money. Yeah. And the rumour of money helps too. You you don't really need to have it. You just need to be... People People need to think you have it. Yeah. He was a great collector of jewels and gold and silver plate. I read that when he died, he had just enough money to cover his funeral. I can only assume that it was literally money they were talking about because his wealth lay in all these accumulated luxuries. Right. So... And how many luxuries disappeared when Richmond Palace burnt down? mm, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. But he still had the money to rebuild it, though, didn't he? Yes, he did. After 1499, the role of the Council Learned had become more clearly defined. Council Learned in Law wasn't really a committee of the main council. It was more a collection of councillors who came together for specific reasons. They didn't even have a designated place to meet. They just met where they all happened to be, which could be in London or on progress with the king. All the members, apart from Bray and two clergymen, had legal training. The poet John Skelton described Bray's men as those who stood in small groups in the corridors of power, quote, in sad communication, who pointed and nodded meaningfully, who strolled through the galleries and chambers in constant motion so as not to be overheard, unquote. Sounds almost like, almost like ghosts. <laughs> yes, yeah, so as John Le Carre feel about it, I feel we have people working below the radar. Yeah. Maybe a bit dodgy. From the start, the Council Learned was hearing cases including trade regulations, corruption of sheriffs and jurors, escapes of prisoners, false returns, riots, livery, retaining, offences against proclamations, failure to take up knighthoods, the King's feudal rights. I'm sorry, you can get in rights. trouble for not taking up a knighthood? You have to pay. Oh. Well, people weren't taking them up because they have to pay for it. So now if you don't make sure you're... you have to pay if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> mm. Yeah, because people were thinking, well, I don't need this knighthood and you know, I'd rather have the forty quid or whatever it was. Do you but... still have to pay for a knighthood? So Sir Elton I John and no... Sir Lewis Hamilton paid a fortune for it? I don't know. And I'll look Sir that Patrick up. Stewart. <laughs> yes. That's a lot of money. Sir Ben Kingsley, he's the one that always insists on being called really? Sir. <laughs> yeah, even in local shops, apparently. My mum and dad used to live next next near to him, and it was a running joke around there that he always insisted on his Sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. He should just go to the southern states. They call everybody Sir and Ma'am. Uh, yeah. yeah, but that wouldn't you know, take take out the uh, exclusivity there, yes, wouldn't it? Yes, but would then it be Sir Sir Ben Kingsley? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh dear. I, I, don't, I wouldn't want one. I'm not going to be a Sir, but I, I don't think I'd want one. <laughs> and certainly not if I've got to pay 40 quid for no. it. <laughs> I think it was 40. That's stuck in my mind. So it's just quite a lot of money in those days. Yes, it is. Mm. Hello, Editing Lucy here. 
a short postscript on how much it will cost you to become a knight or dame. From what I could tell, you do not now have to pay for any honours because it would give the appearance that you had bribed your way to a knighthood. However, if you have been inexplicably left off the honours list in Great Britain, you could buy a knighthood from the Grand Dukedom of Pomerania and Livonia for just €199 Euros just for you, or €299 Euros for you and your spouse. And given that that's pretty much what it cost me to get all our cats inoculated yesterday, that seems like a bargain. However, if that seems a bit steep, you can buy an honour from the Principality of Sealand. Sealand is an unrecognised state on a metal landing tower in the middle of the North Sea. You could be a lord or lady for £24.99, a baron or baroness for £39.99, a sir or dame for £89.99, or a count or countess for £199.99. But anyway, yes, the council learned quite a range of responsibilities for them. There's also one case of treason and several of murder. Oh dear, why are they... Well, precisely, the source I looked at said, why were these latter ones being heard before the council learned and saying it was a mystery? But we learnt in the cameo episode of the tragic tale of Thomas Sunnyth, yes. which will be coming out after this one, that an accusation of murder, whether real or trumped up, can be a cover for the recall of debts and recognizances. Ah. You know, I'm going to accuse you of murder. If you don't pay up, we will ca we'll carry on with this case. If you pay up... Perhaps we'll just forget about it because it didn't actually happen. But anyway, yes, you'll hear all about poor Thomas Sunniff in uh, a week and a bit's time. This really is so, just uh, extortion. Yes, yes, it is. Legal extortion. Official extortion, yes. yeah. Mm. Well, I think Thomas Sunniff's case was illegal extortion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think there was anything legal about that. Also... The ideal would be to get as many cases as possible to be diverted through the council learned, since then the fines would go to the royal coffer and not to the exchequer. So straight under Henry's bed. Ah. Mm. Ah. And many of the cases are ambiguous, since they are recorded as, quote, debts due to the king, unquote, which could mean many, many, many things. Yes, it could. It's interesting that you've got the exchequer and then the king's coffers separate. Well, they are now because... They made sure it was. Yes. That's what, that's what Bray, Bray was all about, really. Yes. Getting money to the king. Yes. Because he worked for the king. He didn't work for government or... Yeah. It may seem that Henry's desire to squeeze every prerogative right shows him to be obsessed with money, but I didn't see it as being entirely that. It seems to me that, yes, he wanted the money. He always wanted the money. But just as much, he didn't want to be taken for a ride... He didn't want anyone to be getting something for nothing at his expense because he'd not just be losing money, he'd be losing authority, losing, right. losing face. Right. And given his precarious perch on the throne, he couldn't afford to do that. No. Well, that was my theory anyway. I mean, perhaps it was just the money. No, no, but... it makes sense that way. Hmm. If it was all about the money, it was obviously doing the job well since by 1499, Margaret Beaufort, John de Vere... Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, and Thomas Stanley all had councils running their own estates. So they'd obviously looked at the money rolling into Henry's coffers and seen it, <laughs> decided that was quite a good thing. Oh dear, let's all extort people. Yeah. One of the roles the council came to fill, that of collecting political information, was in place right from the start of Henry's reign. So the council learned can't be blamed for taking over something that was in existence. True. Uh, in most cases, the king's officers began proceedings based on information given to them either by people whose job it was to uncover such offences or by people with a grievance. So we're definitely looking at a situation being set up where people are encouraged to spy on one mm. another and might benefit from doing so. Yeah, never a good thing. No. No, for instance, how did the council find out that Lord Stourton had received back into his service two men who had fought on the Cornish side at the Battle of Blackheath. Were they allowed to do this anonymously? I don't know. Hmm. We, know we heard in um, Leonardo's episode, and I'm not going to put another advert in for Patreon because we've got two already in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> then we're running out. That they, they had little suggestion boxes, didn't they? Just yes. dotted around Florence. And you could just knock on people, really, just... Put in and say, I think I think Leonardo da Vinci is a homosexual. 
And then wow. they'd find themselves up against the, what was it, the counts, the officers of the night, that was it, and have to answer charges based on a bit of paper that had been shoved in a box. That would be terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Mm. Mm. I wonder if that would promote better behaviour, though. You'd be so afraid to be in that little box that you treat everybody as well as you possibly could, but then the fear wouldn't be nice. <laughs> no, it would be a horrible situation to Goodness. live in. It really would. Yeah. Once their case had been brought to court, defendants were put under bonds which ensured their attendance, and some were not allowed to leave London. Failure to attend would result in a fine or arrest. When William Conyers fell ill on the road to Westminster to honour the summons by the council, he sent his lawyer ahead to ask for an extra two or three days because he was so frightened that he'd be judged in contempt for non-appearance. <sighs> And I'm not sure of the date of this, so I don't know whether it was in Bray's tenure or later in Dudley and Empson's, because we know it got more horrific later on. Yes, exponentially worse. Mm. But because the council had no fixed place to meet, this meant it was very difficult for defendants to know where to turn up. Oh. And even the clerk didn't always know much of the time. Oh, dear. You know you have to appear, but you don't know where? Yes, oh. and writs could be sent out to anyone at any time. And these writs didn't even, as we, I think we saw this in um, Dudley and Empson's episodes, that these writs didn't even have to include the charge. No. They would often just say, quote, to answer to such things that can be objected against him, unquote. Goodness, so they could sit there and say, let's put out these writs. Oh, wait, let's go elsewhere now. And then we can fine yeah. everybody for not showing up. Well, sometimes they're on a progress with the king. So well, that makes sense. You, yeah. People... People just didn't know where they were going to be. Oh, dear. So they were heading off to court with no idea where to go and what would be the charges when they got there. And that must surely have been designed to be part of the intimidation. No kidding. You'd agree to anything mm. just to get out of it. Yeah. I'll pay you whatever if I can just leave. I mean, it's it's bad enough if you've got to do something like that and you're thinking, well, I hope the bus gets in in time and but, and, and I've checked where it is and I'm, you know, I'll get there an hour early or something. If you've no idea where you're going, no kidding. it's... Um, yeah. And it takes you forever to travel, so once you do know, you may have mm. no possibility of getting there on time. Yeah. Ugh. And that was right from the start, so we can blame Bray for that. Uh, yeah, see, I, I was thinking as soon as I said exponentially worse, we're still pandering to all of the charges that Ebenson and Dudley received after mm. Henry's death. For all we know, it was just as bad with Bray. How much were they, they paying the cost for, for Bray as well? Yes. I mean, he was dead, so... Yes. And that's the that's the frustrating thing. Is it so hard to tell? Yes. <laughs> I, I hoped that I'd be able to say at the end of this, OK, Bray was the good guy, Dudley and Empson were the bad guys, or it was grim all the way through. But it's so hard to work out because a lot of this, as I said earlier, a lot of a lot of the complaints about it were to were, were once Dudley and Empson had been arrested and it was safe to complain. Yes. And they were the only ones alive to complain about. Mm hmm. Hmm. So we don't we don't know whether they're complaining specifically about Dudley and Empson or about the whole system. All we can say for sure is that the amount of money taken in by the Council Learned really, really increased under Epson and yes. Dudley. There is no question about that. We've got those financials. Yeah. But we don't know if the tactics were exactly the same or mm. if it was that the tactics themselves got worse and it was just more yes, people. Yes, I mean, it might have been that it was just as bad, but they hadn't, they hadn't sort of got going. Yet. Yes. Mm. The difference between the council learned in law and other courts, not that the council learned in law ever called itself a court, was that they did things purely in the interests of the king, not in the interests of law. Which is should be exactly the same thing when you're a monarch. It should be. Yes. And possibly, to start with, it was. I mean, we might not be talking about Bray being a nice person and Dudley and Epson being an awful person. We might talk be talking about Henry being a better person at the beginning than he was at the yes. end. So mm. People do change when they've got power, especially if people are trying to take them yeah. off of power. They get nastier. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm sure he must have been paranoid. We had a lot to be paranoid yes, about. Is, is it paranoid when you've really got people <laughs> after you? Edmund de la Pole, maybe ineffectual, but mm. he is there and he does want yeah. to take over. Well, actually, he mm. didn't in the end. All he wanted was his lands back. <laughs> <laughs>
the the king was what the learned in law, the, the council learned in law was all about. You had the yeoman of the guard protecting the king's body and the council learned in law protecting the king's rights. Mm-hmm. The only control on the council was the king. Um, Henry never sat in judge judgment, but he did make sure that he was kept informed on cases and he sent instructions on how a case might be prosecuted. Did he sign off on all the judgments as well, like he did for the financials? We don't know because we don't, most of them, we don't know the outcome of the cases. Yes, there was never, there wasn't. It's not that it was never written down. It was just very rarely written down. And it, mm. when I was researching Amson and Dudley, it felt like the ones that were solid, you had evidence, you had multiple people, you had things in writing, those were written down. And you could see that yeah. the judgment makes sense. But the ones that there were no evidence or they didn't want to produce the witnesses... We've got mentions of them, but nothing official was written. It is extremely frustrating. It's like reading an Agatha Christie with the last few pages missing. You think, well, who did it? (laughs) (laughs) That would be horrible. Oh, my goodness. But yes, it's, yeah, I mean, because maybe because we're used to our crime dramas and things, you want the genuine world, really, don't you? You want to know. It just stops. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you've you've lived you've lived through this case with this person, and then suddenly you think, well, what happened yes, to them? It just disappears. <sighs> uh, I think we can safely conclude that there was no possibility that the king didn't know exactly what the council was up to at any time yeah. before and after Bray. And is that which is in the interest of the crown necessarily, or even possibly, in the interest of the country? I'm getting to the point where it's definitely a not. Mm. I, I found a foreign parallel to Henry the Seventh's policy of tying up his subjects in bonds and recognizances. Oh, yep. And that that foreign ruler was Ivan the Terrible. Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> but Ivan the Terrible came back, came in later, so maybe he took it from mm, Henry. Maybe, ooh. Well, to give Henry his due, that is where the comparison ends. <laughs> And then on top of that, he's like, you know what I need to do? I need to marry into that family. Let's let's try to yes. get Elizabeth. <laughs> mm. Well, who knows? I mean, we might do Ivan the Terrible at some point. Yeah. In many, many, many years to come. Yeah. 29 years. <laughs> 29 years. <laughs> well, it's a long standing. Only 27 and a half because we've done a, a year and a half. So it's only 20, a mere 27 and a half now. <laughs> Yeah, I had assumed that Bray was old school and Dudley and Empson were the new kids on the block. But Empson was Bray's right-hand man right from the start. He was appointed on the same day as Bray. Oh, right. Dudley came later and was employed by Bray. Right. Enfor- enforcing the king's rights in Sussex. And later, Bray used Dudley as a means to try to weaken the independence of the City of London. I was thinking maybe he was still smarting because only having got half the loan <laughs> yes. that he demanded from. <laughs> we'll give you 2000 We don't have 4000 Yes. You've already taken all our money. Isn't that interesting? In the Shadow of the Tower, Bray's not in it. In that series. Well, it's, it's so hard to pinpoint something specific to Bray. Mm-hmm. That's what I found. I mean, yes, you hear a lot about him, but it's in a sort of general council type way. It's not about him. And there's nothing about his personal life yeah. at all. So as a, as, a, as a drama character, he's a complete dead loss. True, true. Um, you, you may have noticed we've not actually heard much about at him, all. really. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I've padded it out quite a lot with a lot of political and judicial uh, Extrajudicial stuff. Oh, we said that in one go. Did, did, yes. <laughs> but no, I didn't. I think he's about the person I've done so far that I found least mm. about his own personal private life. Hmm. And it's, ha- it's hard to tell whether Bray was using the same underhanded and intimidating techniques that Dudley and Epson used, except that all the examples I found of cases where intimidation and the constant recalling of people in, in front of the council took place happened after Bray died in 1503. Really? That doesn't mean they didn't go on before then, but none of the examples I found were in Bray's time. Huh. 
So is that a coincidence? It seems unlikely, but we can't say it's impossible. Because I was trying to find out if Bray was really more softly, softly than Dudley and Empson. But as I said before, I couldn't find out for certain, only that it seemed he was. And the trouble is that historians are people, and people like to read about scandal, corruption and general bad behaviour. Very true. So if you want your book to sell... <laughs> Go for Dudley and Empson. Don't go for Bray. No, but we have read a couple of books where it was a very interesting person. And I'm like, oh, you have made this as dry as humanly possible. <laughs> He's doing yes. something insane right now. And you're reading it as if it's just that monotone character on a TV show that you never mm. get any sort of emotion. Yeah. Reminding you of history lessons at school. <laughs> they should be so fascinating. And they were always obsessed with dates. Dates dates are not history. They're not. I tend to use a lot of dates because we're talking in a quite a small amount of time with Henry the Seventh reign. Yes. So each each year makes a difference yes. now. It's, is it is it before or after Perkin? Yeah, exactly. It puts other people Edmund. in context. But when you're just learning about somebody and they say, in this date they did this, and this date they did this, yeah. stand alone. That's just, it, it doesn't work. No. No. He seems to have had very little adverse criticism from his contemporaries, which could mean that there was nothing to criticise, or it could mean that he was so close to the king that no one dared criticise him. Again, we're, <laughs> we're left in limbo, as we so often are with history. <laughs> But we do know that he did trap people in debt to the crown and then set fines so high that people are unable to pay them. So that then he very kindly took over their debt in return for their land. Oh, how kind of you. Because their land is, you know, an annual income. And you've mm -hmm. just taken that away. How yeah. rude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think anyone who could do that could probably do most of the things that Dudley and Empson did. Yes. And also, I, we heard in Perkins' episode, which was quite a while back now, about William Worsley, the Dean of St. Paul's. And you can see how his life changes when he falls into the clutches of the Council Learned by his accounts. Because before 1495, he spends £22, 7 shillings and four and a half pence on wine. And then after that date, it falls to just three pounds. <laughs> and we, we see expenditure on medicines. Possibly showing the psychological and physical toll this is having on, on right. him. And while this is going on, he is paying instalments of £10 to Reginald Bray. Directly to Bray. To Bray. Ooh. Yeah. Specifically Bray, not Dudley and Emerson. Yeah. <laughs> but on the plus side, he's not drinking his problems <laughs> away. So. <laughs> but we also have to think about the fact that they couldn't really drink the water. Yeah. Oh, he's now dehydrated on top of everything else. <laughs> Although I don't know if you get hydrated from drinking wine. <laughs> no, no, you don't. No. No, I can guarantee from how I felt this morning that you don't get hydrated. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Out of the 62 peerage families during Henry's reign, 46 were, for a time, quote, at the king's mercy, unquote. Oh, goodness. Yeah, either through acts of attainder which Henry was more reluctant to reverse than Edward IV had been, or through bonds and recognizances. But interestingly, very few nobles found themselves enmeshed in the Council Learned before Bray's death. This is why your money's coming in afterwards, I think. Mm -hmm. But was that be because, as a commoner, Bray would have felt awkward issuing bonds to his betters? No. <laughs> no. From what I gleaned of his characters, I thought that was very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> He was quite happy to tell the Earl of Suffolk, Edmund de la Pole, he was about to be indicted for murder. Yes. So, and in that case, it, that was very true. He had. Hmm? He was just a commoner. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, and so are you. Some of the things we say are just so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You thought he was a commoner, so it was okay. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, I... If we, if we had to choose a moment to go back in time, I think I might go for that one. <laughs> when, when Bray met Edmund. Just to watch. Yes. I would love to be a time traveller, if only just <laughs> to get the answers. <laughs> yes. Oh, blimey, where do we start? We've made we've asked so many questions. Princes in the Tower. That's come up so many times. Yeah. We'll start there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Perkin. 
it may also have been that at this time Henry was worried about the succession. I mean, once Bray went, because Arthur had died, as had Elizabeth of York. Yes. Prince Henry was very young. Maybe Henry the Seventh had taken to heart the information about Lord Dobney, it's possible t- treachery, and plans to disrupt the succession. So it's possible, and I know I'm being a bit like the F- Francis Lovell book, it's possible, maybe, <laughs> you never know, <laughs> that Henry was using these methods to emasculate the nobility to ensure his son's coronation. So it had nothing to do with Bray's death. That makes sense as well. Yeah. Trouble is, everything makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. It's <laughs> picking one. But it must surely have been better under Bray since Bray's era gained a rosy glow once the people were into Dudley's era. Yes, but that happens with everybody. The previous yeah. person, even though you loathe them while they were in power, the next person feels worse because you're actually experiencing it. Mm. Well, people said at Bray that he didn't take gifts, only food and drink, unlike this new lot. Well, this was patently rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> he took land. <laughs> And all sorts of things. Bray got rich by taking gifts. Oh, somebody should have given him a bunch of donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> what they were really saying was that when you gave Bray a gift, he did what he said he was going to do. When he took your money for palm greasing and lobbying, he actually did the palm greasing and lobbying. Dudley and Empson just took your money. I'm sorry. So he's an honourable bribed person? I think that's why it seemed once they got into the time of Dudley and Empson. Right. Hmm. I don't th- that doesn't work. An honourable bribey. Is bribey yeah. a word? No, you're the briber. Briber, yes. Also, we do know that the sale of officers went on in Bray's time. English rulers, unlike French ones, didn't sell officers. At least, if they did, they tried to hide it. Ah, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure they did. Henry twice sold the chief justiceship of the Court of Commons, pleas for 500 marks. I'm hoping it's on different occasions and he hasn't just tricked someone into, (laughs) (laughs) two people into having it. (laughs) (laughs) Just fight it out. (laughs) And this was doubly bad since not only was it just not on to sell offices, But it also meant that Henry still had some kind of hold on these people so he could put pressure on them to make the right judgments. Uh. And we know know that Bray knew about the sale of offices since, here we go again, Lord Daubney, no less, bid £100 that Robert Sheffield should have the post of the Speaker of of the House of Commons. Oh, yeah, that would would allow people with money to put in somebody who's going to do what they say. Mm. Ooh. But he was outbid. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, by Bray himself. Oh. For a man called Th- Thomas Englefield who got the job. See, Bray's in a horrible position for that, though, because you could say, OK, I'll pay £100 for this. And he said, I'll pay £100 and 50 pence. Hmm? <laughs> I only have to outdo you by a I penny. don't know how much he bids, <laughs> but personally, I would say that counted as corruption. Yes. Hundred mm. <laughs> percent. There is yes. no doubt that that's not corrupt. Yes, this squeaky clean Bray is mired in filth. <laughs> isn't he? he's, he's just not quite as filthy as the people who come after yes. him. Yes. Uh, the time frame is so small. The council really got going in fourteen ninety nine, and Bray was dead by fifteen o three. Oh, so that's a very short. I mean, the, the, it's a very short time to make any judgments, really. I mean, they made lots of judgments, but I mean, yes. for us to make judgments. Yeah, it's like it probably would have gotten worse, but they were testing what was the possibilities still that mm, early. What they, what they could get away with. Yeah, exactly. And after 1503, there was no reproving word from Bray, no political guidance from, indeed, if he was making any, no political guidance from Morton, no fatherly advice from Jasper Tudor, no calming influence of Elizabeth. There was no one to tell Henry when to stop. Yeah. And Dudley and Empson certainly weren't going to do it. Yes. And Elizabeth most likely would have. We don't have very many records about it, but that no. was the Queen's role. Mm. She was, yeah. To, to try and tone down the hubby. Yes, hubby. that way the king could be as vicious as he needed to be to show his power, and the Queen mm. could act as his foil to say, well, I'm not doing it because I shouldn't do it. I'm doing it out of compassion for my wife. That was yes. a very common role for queens. Mm. That Margaret yeah, of Anjou she... just failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you needed a Margaret of Anjou because you had Henry, Henry the Sixth. <laughs> you needed 
<laughs> you needed something. You needed somebody. <laughs> Anybody. <laughs> When Perkin invaded Scotland, he listed the people that he thought were at fault in the governing of England. Inevitably, this included Reginald Bray. He said, quote, Caitiffs, and caitiffs are cowards, caitiffs and villains of simple birth, hmm? mm. by which, <laughs> pots and kettles, eh? <laughs> by which subtle inventions and pilling of the people have been the principal finders, occasioners, and counsellors of the misrule and mischief now reigning in England, unquote. So, did he have a point? <sighs> On the other hand, Polydor Virgil called him, quote, father of his people, a man of gravity, unquote. Really? Edward Halls said, quote, he was a father of his country, a sage and a grave person and a fervent lover of justice, who, if any injustice were done, would plainly reprehend the king and give him good advertisement how to reform that offence and to be more circumspect in another like case, unquote. And they were going after crooked sheriffs and dodgy juries, okay. so you can look at that. But, as we've heard, Bray was up to his own fair amount himself, yeah. So it's okay for me, but it's not okay for anybody else. Do as I say, <laughs> not as I do. <laughs> so, yeah, will the real Reginald Bray please stand up? Should we rate him? <laughs> yeah, we can try. <laughs> I mean, normally I'd say something about his death or where he was buried or something. I don't know what he died of. He was 63. That's, that's often enough in Tudor times. But oh. he yeah, just goes. OK, well, at least we know it wasn't murder. He wasn't. He died in his, well, possibly in his bed. I mean, yes, it was a natural death, either illness or old age or something. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't beheaded. <laughs> Quite good going. <laughs> and fibbly. Intrigue. I wouldn't put him as an intriguer. I think he's definitely a strategist. Yes, but he's out and out a strategist. He has the king's permission. He doesn't need to intrigue. No. Yeah. I was. I did put here. I'm happy to modify this if you think otherwise. But no, I think it's a zero. Well. To other people, it it's corrupt, but it's not intrigue. Mm. There's no... Sp well, we don't know. Was he spying? Did he use spies to create these... They've got politi political information, so they were using... Yes, they were using informers. I think he's got to have some, because... Yeah. With so, so much dodgy dealing... Yes. He had to find a way to create the charges. Yes, and he... He was set, setting up the council learning law from scratch and yeah. he had to be able to work out what he was going to be able to, to do. I'm going to give him a one for setting think. up the council learned. I'm going to give him a two for starting to find people who will anonymously complain. And I'll give him a three for following through when he didn't need to. So three in total. Yeah, I mean, having said he's he's not an intriguer, there must be some intrigue going on, as we said, because what, a lot of what he was doing must surely have been quite secret yeah. or keeping something from somebody else, not necessarily completely secret. I'll go for a four, I think. Antiperistasis. Rise and fall. Well, his father was either a surgeon who administered to kings or he was a common and garden leech. Either way, Bray became astonishingly wealthy and influ influential. So it's either a big rise or one hell of a big rise. And he didn't fall in the end like many others do. It feels like a hell of a big rise because he was a commoner and he ends up in charge of the council learned over top of mm. a... And pretty much in charge of the king as well, from what some people say. That he could speak, speak back to him and say, Yeah. No, you can't do that. I'll do that. You can't do this. I want to give him an eight because that's a tightrope that he was walking and he managed to keep on going until he died. He did. I wonder if, if he had lived beyond Henry the I wonder what Henry the Eighth would have made of him. Well, he probably would have taken him out with Epson and Dudley. Might well have done. Hmm. Hmm. Um, you're going for an eight. Um, yes, I am going for an eight. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's a big rise. Yeah. He was very, very, very important. Yes. And I mean, he's making decisions over earls and counts, so he really outranks all of them. 
And they're terrified of them. Yes. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I would be. Uh, so that is 16 for antiperistasis. Yes. Doing very well so far. Uh, well, doing reasonably so far. <laughs> <laughs> Martyrdom. I have nothing for this. Zero. <laughs> he made it all the way to the end doing everything he wanted to do. Yeah. And it sounds like he yep. never put himself in danger. I don't think he was really. No. He had the king. Yeah. had king in his pocket. Yeah. As long as, the, as long as the king was there, he was all right. Yes. His danger was if but either De La yeah. Pole had succeeded or, or... But even then, he had already accused one of murder. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and we know the other one hated him, so... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Perkin, so yes, uh, zero. Bateen. Bateen, quite a long one. Okay. And long and disparate. One, one thing he did leave behind him was lots and lots of dosh. It turned out that no one was immune from the council learned. Bray had been at the forefront of the campaign against custom evasion, but when he died, it emerged that he had infringed the regulations on wool exports. <laughs> And his executors were fined £5,600. But they paid this off incredibly quickly, <laughs> just showing how, how very wealthy he was. We've got that under Bray's bed. Here you go. <laughs> yes. Well, I think his Bray, he must have his nose touching the ceiling and have so much under his bed. He may have been said to usher in a new form of government because the social origins of the new men were lower than the previous governors, so they may have paved the way for people like Wolsey and Cromwell, like we said. Okay, yeah. uh, Bray was an important source of information for Polydor Virgil. So anything we know through Virgil yes. might well have known from Bray. He got a lot of information from Bray. Mm. The dry dock at Portsmouth, the first one in the country, was Bray's idea. Oh! And we get a look at Reginald Bray, architect, a lot of buildings, extensions, improvements are attributed to Bray. He's said to have designed his manor house in Eton, now called Eton Bray. In Bath, he's supposed to have assisted with the cathedral. Well, there isn't a cathedral in Bath, so I presume they must mean Bath Abbey. But oh. um, he funded, and I'm not sure if he had any other imp input into that, St George's Chapel, Windsor. And the aisles of St George's are heavily decorated with his arms and his badge of a hemp bray. What is a hemp bray? A hemp bray was an implement used to separate the fibres of hemp from the tougher outer coating of the dried stems of the plant. Ah, OK. For linen, it's called a hackle. Oh, right. Well, this is sort of a pun, really. A hemp right. bray. So he right. uses it yep. for his own symbol. The representation, <laughs> representation of bray in the Magnificat window of the Priory of Great Malvern is, to quote Margaret Condon, quote, entirely conventional, showing him bovine and beardless, unquote. Bovine? <laughs> bovine. Yes. He's a cow? <laughs> I don't know. Well, we'll look at the picture and flaunt to flaunt, 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 but you can see, you can, uh, I didn't see any bovinity, <laughs> actually, that's a word. <laughs> he apparently designed Henry VII's chapel in Westminster, where Henry and Elizabeth now lie, and, it, and that is stunning. Oh. Hmm. But his piece de resistance... The real feather in his cap was that he designed the tower of St. Mary's Church in Taunton. Oh! <laughs> Where, if you were to stand on the top, ironically, you'd be looking down on the Perkin Warbeck pub. <laughs> <laughs> have you been there? Did you go? Yes, I have. I've been to see concerts there. And in fact, I was just reading that and a friend of mine sent me a picture of the door of it. It's got two angels etched in it and said, guess where I am? And I had no idea where she was. And when she told me, I said, that's, that's uncanny. I have literally just been reading <laughs> that Reginald Bray designed the, t the tower. So I haven't been since I knew this, so I shall go, I have to go and have a look <laughs> and enjoy the tower. Yeah. So quite a lot of, quite, he left quite a lot behind. Whether anyone, well, I can say no one's heard of him because every time they've mentioned I'm doing Reginald Bray, who? <laughs> Completely blank <laughs> looks. Yes. I keep saying to people, don't worry. I mean, for a start, he's relatively obscure. And secondly, it's in Henry VII's reign and no one knows about yes. Henry VII's reign anyway. Did you mean Henry VIII? So, yes. There was a seven. Had to come before eight. <laughs> it did. <laughs> he left a lot, but no one's heard of him. 
Yeah, but even leaving a lot. Well, we've got two architectural that still survive. Yes, and if it's true about West, the Henry the Seventh Chapel in Westminster, I mean that is that's huge. Yeah, as an architectural thing, although obviously he's not known as an architect. Yeah, so people don't really know him. Hmm. I'm thinking of it too, because nobody knows him. Yeah. One for the tower, one for the app chapel. Yeah, I think I might give him a three because he's. I mean, the chapel is a, a big thing. I mean, that's. I mean, we've got two of our people in it because if Bray designed it and Torrigiano made the tomb. Yes, but Torrigiano mm. is known for that tomb. Yes, not Bray. He is. <laughs> no, Torrigiano is known for punching Michelangelo on the <laughs> <Yes>. nose. <laughs> That's a five for Bettine. Flaw of bleeding flaw. Uh, that's not Bray. Well, <laughs> he's the first person. Well, it is. It, that is Reginald Bray, but as you will have gathered, it's a different <laughs> Reginald Bray. I just came across him because he's known as the human letter. He sent himself through the post. Oh, jeez. And I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> he had the largest collection of autographs. He had 20,000 autographs, but not Adolf Hitler's, despite constant pestering. Is that the 30s, 40s with the vest? And... Looks like 40s, yeah. doesn't it? With the, t the hair and the tash. Yeah. It's almost as if Hitler had other things to do than send people <laughs> <laughs> autographs. But anyway, yeah, the next one is our Reginald Bray. Oh, he's quite attractive, actually. Well, he's, he looks suspiciously like most, most of the <laughs> new men, doesn't he? I mean, he's... Well, they all wear it's, the same office. And they everything, do. But they wear the dark hat. They wear the chain of office. Yes. He's, cl he's clutching a bit of paper. But he doesn't have a crooked or bulbous nose. His eyes both look in the same direction. Yes, <laughs> Compared to true. a lot of others that we've seen, he's, he's not bad. He's not cadaverous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't look like a walking zombie. <laughs> <laughs> no, he looks fine. Yeah. I mean, that's what can be said about him. He looks fine. I'm going to give that a five. It's right down the middle. Well, we st we've still oh. got another one. And this one, us one, is from the Priory at Great Malvern. And that's him looking beardless and bovine. Bovine. It, it, mm. He looks just like every other mini... Wait a second. He's got short hair in the... No, I guess he doesn't. It's just dark. It's hard to see. It's dark. He's blonde in the, in the, in the window, but yeah. maybe that's the only colour glass they had. He's he's knee kneeling. He's got armor. He's wearing his tabard with the pre forty ninety seven arms, and that was when he was made a knight banneret at the Battle of Blackheath. Did he really wear knighthood. armor? I can't. I see him as like this clerical person. I don't see him as somebody who'd be in battle. He was definitely in two battles because oh, we know he went to Blackheath right. and Stoke. Mm. Right. Desperate, desperately trying to make sure that Henry stayed on the throne. And his head stayed on his body. I just assumed he'd be there with scrolls and a quill. Yeah, well, he is on the top ones, but yeah. Mind you, yes, he's, he is reading in his armour. Yeah, well, he's praying. He's praying in his armour. That's the Bible on a hmm. the cloth oh, that I can never remember the name of that cloth. Yeah, right. I hope he's got good hinges on those um, the armour because he's having to kneel. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good symbology, though. I like that. Mm. Because we got sort of before and after. This is yes. the early Bray. And then we got a slight, well, I don't know if it's a slightly later Bray, but we got, yeah, we got fighty Bray and clerical Bray. Clerical Bray holding a demand for more money to somebody. Yes. <laughs> or somebody else's land documents. <laughs> deeds. Yeah. I'm actually going to give that a seven because we've got the symbology and it's nice to have sort of a progression. All the way up to the 1940s. And, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, when he grew that little tash. Uh -huh. um, yes, and we know it's him rather than that one with uh, F Francis Lovell, who was meant to be him, but we had serious doubts. Yeah. These are him. Yes. Yeah, I think seven. I think seven's a good score. Yeah. So that is a seven for total for Flaunt of Flaunt. What are we looking at for a total here? 53.5. Yeah, that's actually that's quite high. Too. Definitely yeah. beat Lovell at 22. <laughs> how did he do against... And that's, and that's... We don't actually know a hell of a lot more about him than Lovell. Yeah. Because Love, Lovell seemed to be so much in the shadows that we didn't hear much oh, about sorry, him. Oh, sorry. I read and the Bray... wrong line. It's 35. Oh. All right. <laughs> I still have to... And Bray was... Because he was a 
council person. It's yeah, yeah, difficult. Thirty-five makes more sense because he was shadowy. We don't know if he was mm. there. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> so I think there is a question here. Are they too delicious or what? I don't feel it. Hmm. I, I feel. In a way, he has to have it because he was so important. Yes. But as a character in the story of Henry. There's not enough about I, him specifically. He could be an automaton. Hmm. Normally I get to the end and I think, nah, or definitely. But with him, I was thinking, I feel I ought to. Time to flip a coin. But. Well, except neither of us seem really to want to. So I think it's going to be a no, isn't it? Yeah. Which does it seem extraordinary. I mean, we've got Day Ayala. Or like that. We haven't gone for Bray, who pretty much ran the country. That's the difficulty. He was pretty... That's true. That's true. He ran the country. He set up something that took off and kept Henry solvent. And to find this reign yes. in many ways. Yeah, actually... I'm going to need to flip a coin. I am right on the fence. Yeah. Should we, should we leave it to... Yeah, let's leave it to fate. Providence. Okay, I'll find, find a groat. Okay, what we got? We got a... We got... We've got Henry the Seventh here. Okay. I'm not very good at this. I always drop it. Okay. Heads is going to be... Oh, sorry, we forgot to ask. <laughs> Heads is ask. going to be a yes, I'm assuming. <laughs> okay. All right, let you look. Looks like... Oh, that's tails. That's tails. You did not get yes. it. Yes. Yes, oh. that's heads. Got the head on it. That's a no from Bray. Care. No. Sorry, Bray. I don't know who we're leaving it up to because uh, Totalus Rankium left it up to Jupiter initially, didn't they? God. So <laughs> we're leaving it up to the council learned. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> let the council decide. <laughs> Yeah. Is this going to cost us money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost certainly. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel a bit yeah. sad about it now. Well, nah, what can you do? Not much. Okay, we're not pulling today because you're taking over De Puebla. Yeah, perhaps we ought to explain yes. the new regime. Yes. So I'm going through quite serious health issues. So Lucy has wonderfully decided or allowed <laughs> or agreed to take over the research for a little while while I try to figure out how to recover from this. But we are continuing and hope to be back to normal as soon as possible. Yes. Yeah. And you you got De Puebla last time, so yes. I'm just taking him on. And I'm, I've already started doing his research and I'm really enjoying it. A lot more information than I got oh, about brain. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> more things were written down. <laughs> well, by him for one, yeah. <laughs> so the other thing I thought we should do, which we haven't done for months and months, is to thank Rex Factor. Because without them, we wouldn't have this format, which yeah, seems to work. Very true. So, yeah. So thank you, Rex Factor. Thank you. For, um, thank you, thank you. Allowing us to do this. Yes. <laughs> Because we quite enjoy I'll it. I'll suddenly rethink. <laughs> now we've decided. Yes. Ah, please don't. <laughs> no, well, they can do that in another 27 and a half years. <laughs> uh, and we're all doing it still. That is the end of our episode on Reginald Bray, or sorry, Sir Reginald Bray. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed it. We'll join us for the next episode on Dr. de Puebla. Thank you for listening. <laughs> You can find details of the podcast and contact us on In the meantime, if money go before, always do lie open. He that wants money, means, and content 
is without three good friends. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hey, hey, hey. Glad you're the way. Hey, hey, hey. Glad you're the it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum dee di do diddly dum dee di do Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum dee di do dum Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum dee di do diddly dum dee di do Hey, hey, hey. It's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum di di do dum. Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum di di do diddly dum di di do. Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum di di do dum. Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do, diddly dum dee do do. Hey hey hey, it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do do. Hey hey hey, it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do, diddly dum dee do do. Hey hey hey, it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do do. Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum dee do do diddly dum dee do do Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum dee do 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 Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray, a diddly dum dee do do diddly dum dee do do Hey, 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 it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do do. Hey hey hey, it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do, diddly dum dee do do. Hey hey hey, it's Reginald Bray. A diddly dum dee do do.